Welcome, viewers, to my video guide where we delve into the fascinating world of the Riemann hypothesis and its connection to the zeta function and gamma function. I am Sorjit Ghosh, a certified accountant from Kolkata, India, with over two decades of experience in number crunching and financial analysis. My passion for numbers has led me to explore the realm of mathematics, and in this video, we will explore the significance of the Riemann hypothesis and its potential implications for prime number distribution. While the Riemann hypothesis remains unproven, mathematicians worldwide are actively investigating various approaches to expand the domain of the zeta function and gain further insights into this intriguing problem. So, let's embark on this exciting journey together. Before we delve into the process of extending the domain of the Riemann hypothesis and my personal journey in attempting to prove it, let's first grasp the essence of what the hypothesis entails. The Riemann hypothesis was formulated by Bernhard Riemann, a German mathematician, in 1859. It revolves around the distribution of prime numbers and their connection to the zeros of the Riemann zeta function. The Riemann zeta function is a complex-valued function defined for complex numbers s with a real part greater than 1. It is computed by summing the reciprocals of all positive integers raised to the power of minus s, starting from 1 and continuing infinitely. In other words, zetas is expressed as the sum of 1 to the power minus s, plus 2 to the power minus s, plus 3 to the power minus s, and so on, extending to infinity. To broaden the domain of the Riemann zeta function, we employ a technique known as analytic continuation. Analytic continuation enables us to extend the definition of a function to a larger domain. In the case of the zeta function, we can extend it to the entire complex plane, excluding the point s equals 1, where it possesses a simple pole. Now, here's where it becomes intriguing. The Riemann hypothesis asserts that all non-trivial zeros of the zeta function reside on a critical line in the complex plane, characterized by the equation real of s equals to half. By extending the domain of the zeta function, we gain the ability to explore these non-trivial zeros and strive to establish the validity of the Riemann hypothesis. Various techniques, such as functional equations, integral representations, and counterintegration, are typically used to extend the domain of the zeta function. However, in my approach, I departed from these conventional methods and built upon Euler's work by employing an induction process that involved taking infinite products of zeta values. Through this approach, I obtained initial results that challenged established notions, such as zeta of 1 being equal to 1 instead of infinity, and zeta of minus 1 being equal to 1 half rather than Ramanujan's value of minus 1 twelfth. This deviation from conventional thinking led me to question the existence of absolute zero or singularities. I realized that the poles of the zeta function could not be left unaddressed and intuited that their removal might hold the key to proving the Riemann hypothesis. If zeta zero leads us to minus one upon two and zeta half is connected to all zeta zeros, then there must be a complex cycle that mathematicians have thus far overlooked. To tackle the problem in a fresh manner, I visualized the Riemann hypothesis as a cyclic challenge, necessitating a restart after completing a full round trip. I constructed a symbolic garland, interweaving fruits and flowers representing zeta values from various branches of the cross-pollinated zeta function, gamma function, pi function, my own delta function, and their periodic harmonic conjugates. These branches stemmed from two fundamental trees, the unified factorial tree and the unified zeta tree. While studying number theory, I questioned why the zeta function could not be defined at 1 and why its pole could not be removed. Although calculus provides rules for checking the convergence of infinite series, they may prove insufficient when dealing with the convergence of series encapsulating infinities into unity. Despite this, Euler successfully derived his sum to product formulas and manually calculated zeta values for certain numbers. Later, Leopold Kronecker further elucidated Euler's formulas by interpreting them as the outcome of approaching the right-sided limit of s. In my pursuit, I decided to follow Euler's approach, considering him as my great-grandpa, and sought to explore how the zeta function diverges at 1 and to introduce new mathematical tools that may be presently absent from the existing context in order to renormalize this infinity. The journey was far from easy, but I firmly believed that perseverance is the key to success. 
I approached each setback with a positive mindset, recognizing that failure provides valuable lessons and insights. It served as an opportunity for me to reassess my approach, identify weaknesses, and deepen my understanding of the number line. Being in a different world, I lack the ability to engage with other mathematicians and researchers to exchange ideas, seek feedback, and find encouragement. Nevertheless, I embraced my self-taught nature and broke the problem down into smaller, manageable pieces. For example, I encountered challenges with the poles of the gamma function, which led me to introduce an additional factorial function to create a twisted pair with the gamma function. I also sought to find an alternate functional equation to remove the pole of the zeta function, among other considerations. During the process, I took regular breaks to rest, recharge, and approach the problem with fresh ideas. I celebrated every bit of progress I made, regardless of how small it may have seemed. I recognized that each step forward not only brought me closer to my ultimate goal but also expanded my knowledge and revealed new insights that would aid me in future endeavors. Now, let me provide you with a summary of the results I have achieved thus far. The Riemann hypothesis has been proven in three different ways, each with varying levels of complexity. One approach involves utilizing the functional equation and introducing the concept of the delta function and the periodic harmonic conjugate of the gamma and delta functions, similar to the gamma and pi functions. The other two proofs are derived using Euler's formula and elementary algebra. By analytically continuing the zeta function to an extended domain, the poles and zeros of zeta values are redefined. Furthermore, other prime conjectures such as the Goldbach conjecture and the twin prime conjecture have been proven based on a new understanding of primes and numbers as three-dimensional entities, as elucidated by Hamilton's four-dimensional quaternions. The imaginary number iota is defined as the natural logarithm of 2, and the logarithm of negative and complex numbers is redefined using an extended number system. Additionally, the factorial of negative and complex numbers is redefined through the use of the delta function and the periodic harmonic conjugate of the gamma and delta functions. Let me take you on a detour of my personal journey so far. As an accountant, I typically don't engage with scientific concepts in my daily life. However, my curiosity was piqued on Christmas Eve in 2012 when there was a hoax circulating that the world would end by December 31st. Although the hoax lacked scientific basis, it compelled me to seek the truth and explore contemporary scientific understanding of the universe. I began by reading Wikipedia articles on physics, a subject that had always interested me despite my limited knowledge from school. It was during this exploration that I encountered a pie chart illustrating the composition of the universe, 69% dark energy, 26% dark matter, and 5% normal matter. This distribution didn't sit well with me, I had a sense that something fundamental must be amiss. Years passed, and in 2015, I returned to my hometown of Kolkata, India, amidst the Syrian crisis. My eldest son started attending third grade at his school, and one day, while searching the internet for fraction worksheets to help him practice, I realized that the seemingly simple numbers I encountered in my daily life were not as straightforward as they appeared. Using my Excel skills, I spent four hours trying to figure out how to create randomized fractional math problems for my son. I discovered that to generate proper fractions that didn't result in recurring decimals, I needed to divide a random number by its larger multiples of 5. I hypothesized that this phenomenon was due to the decimal system we use, with 5 acting as a midpoint. On another occasion, I encountered the fine structure constant, which has an approximate fractional value of 1 upon 137. I couldn't help but notice that it was nearly half of the reciprocal of Charles's constant ratio of 1 upon 273, which I had learned about in school. I struggled to immediately understand the significance of this observation but attributed it to the same midpoint theory I had developed, inspired by concepts of balance and averages in financial accounting. It's worth mentioning that I often made similar mistakes in my research papers, leading to their rejection from prestigious journals with discerning readership. My focus was always on achieving zero, while any additional degrees of freedom were secondary considerations. This singular pursuit eventually led me down a winding path of duality, at times losing myself in the vastness of infinity. 
However, my desire to return safely to my starting point served as a compass, guiding me through the boundless expanse. After catching a glimpse of the greatest zero encompassing both time and space, with the zeros of the zeta function merely being a subset, I found myself overwhelmed and succumbed to a deep slumber. Upon awakening, I discovered a minus one in the palm of my hand, symbolizing my encounter with the great zero. Euler had seen it his way, and I had seen it mine, yet we both arrived at minus one. If you embark on this voyage and complete the cycle of three, you too will receive the gift of an additional minus one, which must be placed meaningfully to maintain equilibrium in any equation. I chose to position mine in the exponent, but it should be wielded wisely, as it has the potential to unleash infinite possibilities at any moment. As time passed, I dedicated my spare moments to delving into the mind-boggling realms of Einstein's special and general relativity, as well as the perplexing world of quantum mechanics and its bewildering implications. I yearned to solve one of the unsolved mysteries of physics, to make a meaningful contribution to the field. One day, while browsing through Wikipedia, I stumbled upon a list of unsolved physics problems, which led me to another list of unsolved mathematical problems. The latter list was relatively shorter, and I found myself captivated by the Riemann hypothesis, one of the seven Millennium Prize problems. Drawing upon my self-constructed midpoint theory and its rudimentary connection to the Riemann hypothesis, I pondered why such an elegant proposition had remained unsolved for over a century and a half. I took it upon myself to tackle this monumental challenge, starting from scratch. In 2019, I began with Euler's version of the zeta function and, employing an induction method akin to Euler's, I grasped why the Riemann hypothesis ought to be true. However, my initial elementary proof was met with rejection. In 2020, the world was gripped by the COVID-19 pandemic and I found myself unemployed and confined to lockdown. This presented me with ample time to focus on unraveling the Riemann hypothesis. I realized that my initial elementary proof lacked the novel mathematical insights necessary for such a pivotal problem. I began to accumulate the pitfalls of contemporary mathematics, which may be the reason why we lack the tools to solve the Riemann hypothesis, as acclaimed mathematician Terence Tao once remarked in an interview. I observed that the imaginary number iota had ensnared both mathematicians and physicists in its illusory realm, keeping them engrossed. My initial elementary proof called for a half-unit circle, contradicting the conventional notion of a unit circle. I had discovered a way to incorporate a dual unit circle within the familiar concept of a unit circle, but further justification was needed. Although complex analysis was not my cup of tea, I delved into it to ensure that my work did not violate any principles. I found no such violations, yet I encountered only rejections. Returning to Riemann's functional equation, I sought to develop a more rigorous approach. I came across a particular theorem in complex analysis known as the harmonic conjugate theorem, which states that if a function is analytic in a given region, there must exist a harmonic conjugate of the original function. I realized that if I could slightly modify Riemann's functional equation by replacing the gamma function with an equivalent that is not undefined at 1, I could potentially eliminate the function's pole. I understood that this would challenge the well-established divergence of the harmonic series, as proven by Nicole Orsma centuries ago. This journey led me to introduce a new zeta function that spiraled cyclically to form a continuum, with these cycles serving as placeholders for infinity. However, I soon realized that I had inadvertently opened Pandora's box, giving rise to additional complications and dilemmas along the way. In order to tackle these novel problems, I found it necessary to revisit Euler's gamma function and create a variant of it which I named the delta function. However, even with this new function, I still faced an incomplete picture. To fill in the missing pieces, I delved into the realm of negative factorial functions and introduced two additional functions that served as periodic conjugates of the original gamma function and the newly discovered delta function. With these four factorial functions, I was able to extend the domain of factorials to negative numbers and the domain of the zeta function to negative even numbers. I brought all these components together and observed that the functional equation for my harmonic conjugate zeta function provided the long-awaited proof for the Riemann hypothesis. Yes, I had achieved it. 
I celebrated the victory brought about by the pie by three angles, which propelled me into higher dimensions and granted me the proof. It is worth noting that one ray of the pi by four angles also extends into the fourth dimension and has a presence in the unit sphere. However, I have left this branch of exploration for others who may have an interest in working with pi further. Due to the popularity of calculus, Euler's number E has become more widely known than pi, which is primarily associated with the study of geometry, particularly the geometry of circles. In my research paper, I hinted at the possibility of pi serving as a base for complex logarithms, where hyperbolic numbers in its exponent yield the conjugate form of Euler's formula, e to the power i pi equals minus 1, which can be written as pi to the power j e equals minus 1. I sought natural occurrences that could validate this novel idea, but lacking access to astronomical data for verification, I turned to Google for information on the 60-degree latitude. The 60-degree latitude line runs parallel to the equator at a latitude of 60 degrees both north and south. One notable example is the Southern Ocean, which surrounds Antarctica. As the 60-degree south latitude line traverses this region, it encounters vast expanses of open water with no significant land masses, resembling the notion of zero in relation to the zeta zeros. In the northern hemisphere, the 60-degree north latitude line passes through the Arctic Ocean. While various islands exist within the Arctic Circle, such as Greenland, Svalbard, and the Canadian Arctic Archipelago, the specific stretch along the 60-degree north latitude may also cross areas of open water, particularly during warmer months when sea ice melts. Although the presence or absence of land along the 60-degree latitude line can be influenced by factors such as tides, seasonal ice formation, and climate conditions, these regions are generally characterized by expansive stretches of open water without significant land masses intersecting the 60-degree latitude line directly. After obtaining a natural signature as described earlier, I expanded my investigations to more generalized conditions, such as the entire galaxy and the universe, in an attempt to solve the mysteries of dark matter and dark energy. The intriguing coincidence of dark energy's percentage being equal to the natural logarithm of 2 arises from the numerical proximity between the current estimate of the ratio of dark energy's energy density to the critical density of the universe in the field of cosmology. Dark energy is a hypothetical form of energy believed to be responsible for the observed accelerated expansion of the universe. Its properties and nature are still not well understood, making it an ongoing subject of scientific inquiry. Similar to how the critical line of the zeta function is responsible for the infinitude of primes and the number system, dark energy also derives its energy from the power of the number line. Even though the universe may be spatially and temporally infinite, it operates in a manner similar to the number line, which diverges to infinity, crossing an infinite number of cycles like e to the power 11, e to the power 22, e to the power 33, and so on. I derived the last two numbers mentioned using only a few physical constants, such as the speed of light, Planck constant, Newton's gravitational constant, Boltzmann constant, mass of the electron, and the Charles gas constant. Yes, you heard it correctly, the Charles gas constant. The intriguing numerical relationship between the fine structure constant and half of the Charles ratio of an ideal gas has kept me awake at night. Connecting the dots to complete the picture requires a certain level of imagination. The fine structure constant, denoted by alpha, is a fundamental constant in physics that characterizes the strength of the electromagnetic interaction between charged particles. Its value is close to 1 upon 137. The fine structure constant is dimensionless and plays a crucial role in various areas of physics, including quantum electrodynamics. On the other hand, the Charles ratio is a constant that arises from the ideal gas law and relates the change in volume of an ideal gas to its change in temperature at constant pressure. Approximately, this ratio is close to 1 upon 273. Although the Charles gas constant is not considered a fundamental constant, it should be regarded as more fundamental in the middle scale in which we live. Mathematically, it is closely related to the reciprocal of pi to the power 4 multiplied by Euler's number e, the base of the natural logarithm. Can you imagine the circle that emerges from these connections? 
If you, too, want to lose sleep over these ideas, then welcome to the world of both flammable and inflammable mathematics. Now, if you feel that you are listening to another random crackpot, I understand your skepticism and you are excused in advance. Even if I were to be labeled a crackpot after 10 years of effort in understanding numbers, I would accept it and the scientific community is also excused. As I am not seeking personal gain from my work, I will try to remain indifferent to whatever fate awaits it. I will not cry because, as my mom once told me, boys don't cry. However, I would also like to clarify that I will not tolerate any hateful or racist comments from potential haters. Abusive comments will be addressed fairly. Therefore, I kindly request all viewers to refrain from posting any form of offensive remarks. One of the fundamental principles of scientific inquiry is subjecting ideas and claims to scrutiny, experimentation, and peer review. This rigorous process ensures that scientific knowledge is reliable and evidence-based, preventing the proliferation of unfounded or erroneous ideas. However, this system can unintentionally create barriers for novel or unorthodox concepts that challenge prevailing paradigms. When scientific works are not given due recognition or are dismissed solely because they are not immediately understood, several negative consequences can arise. Firstly, it stifles intellectual curiosity and discourages researchers from exploring unconventional ideas, limiting the diversity of perspectives and approaches within the scientific community. This, in turn, hinders breakthroughs and innovative discoveries. Secondly, it perpetuates a culture of conformity and orthodoxy, where researchers may be hesitant to deviate from established theories or methods. This bias towards incremental rather than transformative advancements can hinder scientific progress, as scientists fear professional consequences for exploring unconventional avenues. Lastly, it hampers scientific progress by discouraging interdisciplinary collaboration. Many groundbreaking discoveries have occurred at the intersection of different fields, where novel ideas from one domain may not be immediately understood or appreciated by another. Neglecting or dismissing these interdisciplinary endeavors can impede holistic understanding and limit the potential for groundbreaking discoveries. Furthermore, overlooking scientific works that are not immediately understood by the scientific community can have broader societal implications. Scientific research often addresses pressing societal challenges such as climate change, disease prevention, or technological advancements. By disregarding unconventional ideas, we may miss out on potential solutions to these complex problems. To address this issue, it is crucial to foster an environment that encourages open-mindedness, intellectual curiosity, and respectful dialogue within the scientific community. After successfully obtaining a natural signature, I embarked on extending my investigations to more general conditions, such as the entire galaxy and the universe, with the aim of solving the enigmas of dark matter and dark energy. It is intriguing to note that the percentage of dark energy coincidentally aligns with the natural logarithm of 2, which arises from the numerical proximity between the current estimate of the ratio of dark energy's energy density to the critical density of the universe in the field of cosmology. Dark energy is a hypothetical form of energy believed to be responsible for the observed accelerated expansion of the universe. However, its nature and properties remain poorly understood, making it a subject of ongoing scientific inquiry. Similar to the critical line of the zeta function, which is responsible for the infinitude of primes and the foundation of the number system, dark energy draws its energy from the power of the number line. Despite the potential spatial and temporal infinity of the universe, it operates in a manner akin to the number line, diverging towards infinity and encompassing an infinite number of cycles, such as e to the power 11, e to the power 22, e to the power 33, and so forth. Remarkably, I derived the last two numbers using only a handful of fundamental physical constants, including the speed of light, Planck constant, Newton's gravitational constant, Boltzmann constant, mass of the electron, and the Charles gas constant, yes, even the Charles gas constant. The intriguing numerical relationship between the fine structure constant and half of the Charles ratio of an ideal gas has captivated my attention, causing sleepless nights. Although these constants emerge from different domains of physics and lack a direct theoretical connection, they possess a numerical connection. 
The fine structure constant, denoted by alpha, is a dimensionless fundamental constant in physics that quantifies the strength of the electromagnetic interaction between charged particles. Its value is approximately 1 upon 137 and plays a pivotal role in various branches of physics, particularly in quantum electrodynamics. Conversely, the Charles ratio is a constant originating from the ideal gas law, relating the change in volume of an ideal gas to its change in temperature at constant pressure. Approximately, this ratio is close to 1 upon 273. While the Charles gas constant is not typically regarded as a fundamental constant, it holds greater significance within the intermediate scale of our existence. Mathematically, it is closely related to the reciprocal of pi to the power 4 multiplied by Euler's number e, the base of the natural logarithm. Can you envision the circle that emerges from these interconnected dots? If you, too, find yourself losing sleep over these ideas, then welcome to the realm of captivating and thought-provoking mathematics. Now, if you suspect that you are merely encountering another random crackpot, I understand your reservations and I excuse you in advance. Even if, after 10 years of painstaking effort to comprehend numbers, I am labeled a crackpot, I will accept it and I excuse the scientific community as well. Since I am not seeking personal gain from my work, I will strive to remain indifferent to whatever fate befalls it. As my mom once told me, boys don't cry, so I won't shed tears. However, I must also clarify that I will not tolerate any abusive comments from potential detractors. Abusive remarks will be handled equitably. Therefore, I kindly request all viewers to refrain from posting any racist or hateful comments. One of the fundamental principles of scientific inquiry is subjecting ideas and claims to scrutiny, experimentation, and peer review. This rigorous process ensures that scientific knowledge is reliable and evidence-based, preventing the proliferation of unfounded or erroneous ideas. However, this system can inadvertently hinder novel or unorthodox concepts that challenge existing paradigms. When scientific works are not accorded due recognition or are dismissed solely due to their immediate incomprehensibility, several adverse consequences may arise. Firstly, it stifles intellectual curiosity and discourages researchers from exploring unconventional ideas, limiting the diversity of perspectives and approaches within the scientific community. Consequently, breakthroughs and innovative discoveries may be impeded. Secondly, it perpetuates a culture of conformity and orthodoxy, where researchers may hesitate to deviate from established theories or methods. This bias towards incremental rather than transformative advancements can hinder scientific progress, as scientists fear professional consequences for exploring unconventional avenues. Lastly, it hampers scientific progress by discouraging interdisciplinary collaboration. Numerous groundbreaking discoveries have emerged at the intersection of different fields, where novel ideas from one domain may not be immediately comprehended or appreciated by another. Neglecting or dismissing these interdisciplinary endeavors can impede holistic understanding and limit the potential for groundbreaking discoveries. Moreover, overlooking scientific works that are not immediately grasped by the scientific community can have broader societal implications. Scientific research often addresses pressing societal challenges such as climate change, disease prevention, or technological advancements. By disregarding unconventional ideas, we may overlook potential solutions to these complex problems. Let us change the topic. Let's understand how these new mathematical jackpots of reals can lead us to groundbreaking discoveries in every field of applied science. Imaginary numbers, denoted as multiples of the imaginary unit I, are crucial in many areas of mathematics and physics. They are used extensively in complex analysis, quantum mechanics, electrical engineering, signal processing, and more. It would indeed be a groundbreaking discovery with far-reaching implications across various branches of science, mathematics, and technology if imaginary numbers could be integrated with the real number line. The integration of imaginary numbers with the real number line would lead to a more comprehensive and unified mathematical framework. 
It would allow for a deeper understanding of complex functions such as exponential, trigonometric, and logarithmic functions, which play a vital role in various mathematical applications. The development of new mathematical techniques and tools could arise, enabling more sophisticated modeling and analysis in diverse fields. In physics, the merger of imaginary and real numbers would have profound consequences. Quantum mechanics, a fundamental theory describing the behavior of particles at the microscopic level, heavily relies on complex numbers. Quantum mechanics, a cornerstone of modern physics, relies heavily on complex numbers and the concept of the wave function. The wave function describes the probabilistic behavior of quantum systems such as electrons, atoms, and molecules. It provides information about the particle's position, momentum, and other physical properties. By extending the real number line, new insights into quantum phenomena and the behavior of subatomic particles could emerge. It may lead to enhanced mathematical formalism and a deeper understanding of wave-particle duality, superposition, and quantum entanglement. Imaginary numbers being brought down to the real number line, it would impact the mathematical framework of the wave function. Complex numbers play a crucial role in representing the amplitude and phase of quantum states. By extending the real number line, it could introduce new mathematical techniques to describe and analyze quantum systems more comprehensively. General relativity, Einstein's theory of gravity, describes the fabric of spacetime as curved and influenced by mass and energy. If imaginary numbers were integrated into the real number line, it could potentially impact the mathematical framework of general relativity. New possibilities might arise for the analysis of complex spacetime geometries, including those involved in black holes, gravitational waves, and the early universe. It could lead to novel insights into the relationship between gravity and quantum mechanics, an area that remains unresolved even today. The integration of imaginary numbers with the real number line would have practical implications for numerous technological applications. Complex numbers are crucial in electrical engineering, signal processing, control systems, and telecommunications. By extending the real number line, it would provide a more comprehensive mathematical framework for analyzing AC circuits. Complex numbers would continue to play a crucial role in representing voltage and current phasors accurately. It would enable engineers to perform complex calculations involving impedance, reactance, and power factor more efficiently. This, in turn, would contribute to the design, analysis, and optimization of electrical circuits and systems. By extending the real number line, engineers and technologists could develop more sophisticated algorithms, improved signal processing techniques, and advanced control systems. It could pave the way for more efficient digital communication, advanced image processing, and breakthroughs in artificial intelligence. Quantum computers rely on the principles of quantum mechanics and utilize quantum bits or qubits to perform computations. The mathematics associated with quantum computing involves complex linear algebra and quantum algorithms. Complex numbers are integral to representing quantum states, quantum gates, and quantum operations. If imaginary numbers were brought down to the real number line, it would impact the mathematical foundations of quantum computing. The use of complex numbers would remain essential for representing and manipulating quantum states, as well as performing quantum operations and simulations. Extending the real number line might lead to the development of new mathematical techniques and algorithms for quantum computations, enhancing the efficiency and capabilities of quantum computers. Moreover, the integration of imaginary numbers with the real number line could have implications for quantum error correction codes, which protect quantum information from decoherence and errors. The mathematical framework underlying error correction codes would likely continue to rely on complex numbers, ensuring the reliable storage and manipulation of quantum information. The unification of real and imaginary numbers would foster interdisciplinary collaborations and cross-pollination of ideas across all branches of science. It would encourage researchers to explore new mathematical frameworks and develop novel approaches to understanding complex phenomena. This integration could have implications for fields such as chemistry, biology, materials science, and more, by providing enhanced mathematical tools for modeling and simulating intricate systems. 
In my paper, I have provided minimal proofs for various unsolved number theory problems. I refer to these proofs as minimal because they emerge from the already proven prime number theorem once we understand the duality of the number system and its oscillation around the limit of 2. The dual nature of numbers refers to the observation that prime numbers exhibit both irregular and seemingly random patterns, as well as certain statistical properties that can be analyzed through probabilistic methods. For example, let's consider the twin prime conjecture, which states that there are infinitely many prime numbers that differ by two. To approach this problem, we can utilize the prime number theorem and the dual nature of numbers. By invoking the prime number theorem and considering the asymptotic limit of prime numbers, we can show that there will always be infinitely many twin primes with a prime gap of two. This can be seen as a minimal proof for the twin prime conjecture. Similarly, the Goldbach conjecture, which states that every even integer greater than 2 can be expressed as the sum of two prime numbers, can also be approached using the prime number theorem and the dual nature of numbers. In my paper, I also discuss the concept of quaternions in the four-dimensional complex number system and redefine the imaginary number iota to be the natural logarithm of 2. This redefinition allows for a more direct representation of complex numbers without the need for complex notation. Additionally, I propose the use of a scale factor based on powers of 10 to represent complex numbers in a more intuitive way. Although my work is currently not widely known, it is available on websites like vixra.org and other open access repositories. I invite anyone who wants to disprove the Riemann hypothesis to consider my work and cross-check my signature predictions. I believe that my insights, such as extending the domain of factorials and the zeta function, the connection between quaternions and zeta zeros, and the concept of the dual unit sphere, can contribute to a better understanding of the Riemann hypothesis. I acknowledge that further study and analysis are required to fully explore the potential implications and feasibility of my ideas. I encourage others to build upon my work and share it with the mathematical community. While I do not compare myself to mathematical geniuses like Ramanujan, I believe that my contributions can pave the way for solving other unsolved problems in mathematics and physics. I hope that my paper and ideas will be shared and considered by those interested in these areas of research. Thank you for your attention and support. Before I sign off, let me make an official appeal for sharing my work officially once again. Dear Science Community, I am pleased to present my proof of the Riemann hypothesis. After 10 years of research and experimentation, I have successfully demonstrated that the Riemann hypothesis is true. My proof is based on harmonic conjugate of zeta function and its functional equation. The Riemann hypothesis is one of the most important unsolved problems in mathematics. Its proof has eluded mathematicians for over a century. My proof not only solves this problem but also opens up new avenues of research in the field of mathematics. The implications of my proof are far-reaching. It has the potential to revolutionize the way we think about prime numbers and their distribution in the number line. It could also have applications in other fields such as physics, computer science, and engineering. I am sharing my proof with the science community in the hope that it will inspire others to build on my work and advance the field of mathematics. I am not seeking any monetary compensation for my work. My only goal is to contribute to the advancement of humankind. Thank you for your attention. Sincerely, Sorjit Ghosh